this landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. And the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brazil was the man who discovered the topper. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified. Erica Lukes. Well, 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 happy Fantopia Friday. I am happy to be here and spending my Friday evening with you. I want to mention that we've got a brand new show starting tonight, so you can just stick around, get get a margarita, have fun with KCOR tonight. Willie Miranda is making his debut right after my show. He is interviewing Ronnie LeBlanc, who wrote the book Monsterland. It's a great book. I have a lot of respect for Ronnie. Willie's show is called The Paradigm Matrix, where fact and fiction collide. So stick around for that. I will be here and I will be in chat to support him. I'm really excited about this new show. As always, I want to thank everyone for getting into chat, for sending me messages. My favorite people are here, Amy, Bruce, Doug Down Under, Jeff, Lib, Northern UFOs, Susan, Tamara, who's new, and Tim, all of my people in chat. I, I love you guys, and you are the reason that I'm here. I appreciate the fact that you are so kind and respectful and intelligent. You ask incredible questions, and we are all getting the word out that this is incredibly important and we need to preserve history, which my guest this evening is, he knows all about. When I do a, a radio show or when I lecture, I always mention Barry Greenwood because, in my opinion, he is one of the most important people that we all need to know and we need to support him and understand the gravity of what Barry has done for all of us. When I talk to Barry, I see him on Skype and I see his, I mean, it's it's just fo folder after folder after folder of archives, declassified documents, things that he is getting out there. He's scanning them, he's restoring them, scanning them, and then putting them in order and getting them out there on the internet. So each of us who comes into this field and who cares about the subject will go there and learn from all of this research. It is really, uh, like I said, Barry's one of the most important people that, that I have ever met, and I'm grateful that he is my friend and I can learn from him. Barry has pursued the UFO topic since 1964. He was served as an investigator and state section director for Massachusetts MUFON for 10 years. He specializes in researching government documents in the late 1970s, and that led to his publication of the book Clear Intent that he co-authored with Larry Fawcett. This is a book. I've got two different versions, two copies sitting right in front of me. If you do not have this book, you need to get it now. They are hard to find and they're expensive, but it is worth every penny. This is, in everyone's point of view, the most important book you will ever have on the topic. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. He edited newsletter Just Cause for Citizens Against UFO Secrecy from 84 to 98. Much of his research has been published in the MUFON UFO Journal, Flying Saucer Review, and a variety of other international publications. He specialized in UFO history, compiled the New England Airship Wave of 1909, he was involved with UFO Historical Review, a newsletter that made its debut in 1998. He has a published on, online the Union Catalog of Periodical UFO Articles. You can go to Barry Greenwood Archives to check out all of these. They're amazing. He is an associate of the Project 1947 and of Sign Historical Group. I, I mean, Barry, I just have to say that you've you seriously are my hero. 
And I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Oh, shucks. <laughs> but it, it's true. I mean, I, when I, when I started really digging into this subject and finding people that I, I respected and people that cared about sharing information and people that had worked decade after decade to accomplish something for all of us. I mean, you were, you were that person and you have been so kind to me and, and you helped me establish a relationship with Greg Long, who has the ball of lights that you've been feverishly scanning. And that is, you know, this is so, it's so important. And so from somebody who was new in the field and needed good input. You've been that really important source for me. Well, I'm glad I was. And, you know, I, I know that the subject for years has suffered from a very bad image. And I wanted to do something about that because I knew the, the whole business wasn't that way. It wasn't a, a nest of kookiness and, and mistakes and jokes, uh, as was implied in the media. I, I try to focus on the serious aspects of the subject and the serious aspects of history, especially because I remember a lot of those years and what really happened instead of uh, 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 misinformation that circulates about those times now. So, you know, it, it, all the effort is in preserving what really happened then so that people now can know that that was reality rather than some uh, alteration of it. And, and I love that. And I think that's really important. I mean, you know, we've had this conversation. All of us have the conversation about how dysfunctional the UFO field is and how I think a lot of people like yourself, I mean, they you just, you just steer clear of it because of the dysfunction and the fact that a lot of people glom onto things that are, are not factual and, you know, and I, not I, necessarily you know, healthy. I think that there needs to be a middle ground on the subject that seems to have escaped uh, everyone in, in all areas, uh, politics especially now. Where I've always thought you take uh, sides of view and pick from those the best parts of them and put them in the middle. And that's what a, a respectable approach to any subject should be. And a lot of that seems gone now. And I, I'd like to return to that, a moderation of, of uh, viewpoints so that uh, we can clear out the, the fluff from both sides and, and get to the good, solid information that skeptics have as much to say, useful as UFO believers. And we need to hit that middle ground and put the subject out so that people can see it's respectable. It, it, it doesn't advocate extremism. And, and that's good. I was looking through some of your old archives, and in it, there was an editorial, and it, it was, I believe this was you talking about somebody new to the field and taking an interest in it. And, you know, the first section is there is no such thing as a UFO expert. Right. If someone says that he or she is, doubt it. I love it. Yeah, I you know, I put a definition uh in clear intent about a UFO expert. And I felt it was someone who knew everything there was to know about UFOs, except what they were, who was in them and where they come from. And that's pretty accurate because we have dates and, and, and details of stories and all, but it's still unidentified. So how can you be an expert on something that's unidentified? You don't know what it is except for the, uh, fine details of circumstantial evidence that's uh, come from it over the years. Right, right. I, I will say in the, the TV show that I'm on, they do list me as a UFO expert. And it's like, oh, okay. I, yeah, I, 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 cr I cringe at the label because I, know, I, know. I, I can just see people rolling their eyes saying, an expert on what? <laughs> what are you expert on? Uh, on not knowing? <laughs> because that's true. You're an yeah. expert on not knowing what oh, the you're answers not kidding. are. You so, yep. I, I prefer I prefer a researcher. Yes. Yep, I do I do do as well. And but if anybody is an expert, it would be you, I have to say. Well, it, from experience, I guess. You know, you spend a lot of time on something, you're gonna you're gonna pick up a certain amount of information about it. So in that respect, yeah, I, you're knowledgeable rather than an expert. You remember yeah. thing. You remember things that have happened that uh, other people may not have experienced or remembered. 
And and you remember, I mean, I'm always amazed to to talk with you because your memory and attention to detail is impeccable. It's like talking to Paul Dean. You know, mm. it's just this, you know, you get it's just it's in it's incredible. Well, you know, I'm, I'm jealous of Paul because he's done it in a shorter amount of time than I did. He's developed that instinct for investigation and, and information that, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing it for decades now. And you, you could only do it in a spotty fashion because you have a real life to live, too. You can't spend all your time on it if you're in the normal workaday world. Right. So, but Paul has has gotten that in a really rapid amount of time. I, he's, he's extraordinary uh, as far as his knowledge on government information, and, and especially U.S. government. He's he's from Australia. He doesn't <laughs> live here. He's he's way over there, and yet he uh, he knows a, a ton more than the authoritative people here. Absolutely, I mean he. I really think that Paul is is one of those. I mean, people don't understand the gravity of his work, you know, and I, I really feel that they're getting to that point, but they need to realize the type of research that he does. Yeah, it, I mean, now uh, when you do government research, you're really hampered uh, by uh, the law and uh, uh, political uh, evolution over time. When I started uh, with FOIAs years ago, it was shortly after the uh, the current uh, rendition of the Freedom of Information Act was put into law. I believe that was around 1974. And it allowed people to much more easily access uh, government paperwork on the subject. You know, the Air Force had been involved with it for years, as well as many other agencies, CIA, FBI, DIA, and so on. It's, it's just a host of them. So we knew when that law was passed that we were able to, for the first time, get real access. And I, I think I ran over this before when I was on the show in the past, but I, I used a, an old tabloid article to request things. And to my great surprise, uh, secret documents, uh, top secret documents were released uh, from the National Military Command Center. And uh, I, everybody was surprised because it was really the first time I had seriously tried uh, following up on, on FOIA and after that, it was a breeze because it opened so many doors on uh, new sources of uh, paperwork, uh, along with a few other people who uh, have spent most of their lives in the subject, like uh, Brad Sparks and, and uh, at the time, Peter Gersten. He was a lawyer for cause, and he was able to file things uh, uh, to obtain court orders to get documents released when the FOIA didn't work so well. So... We ended up with thousands of pages by the early 1980s, and it was enough to be able to put a book together to report on what was coming out. And it was rather remarkable information. It's absolutely remarkable information. And now I think with Tom DeLonge and To the Stars and all of these things, which we're, we will talk about a little bit later, I mean, it it, it is interesting to look back at, at all of this, especially now, but you you were friends with Bob Todd, and yeah. he was also. I mean, he was he was at one point when he was twenty four harassed by by mm. people, and that's a very interesting story. But I mean, all of you did incredible work trying to to piece the puzzle together. I don't know how Bob did it. He filed thousands of FOIA requests over uh, many years, up until I think the late. 90s early 2000s but uh, he had health issues after that and I, I really miss him i mean he was such a, a a drill bit at getting down to the core of things and uh, he, he had a great knowledge of the archives within government that, that even the people from whom he was requesting the information didn't have that kind of depth they, they he had to explain to them where things were because they didn't know and when they went and looked, yeah, something would turn up. So he, he was he was extraordinary, and uh, and uh, I, I I always emulated what he tried to do. But again, when you have a job and all, you can't work twenty four hours a day on it. He was able to devote a lot of time to it, and he uh, he broke through many walls. 
He did. He was amazing. How old was he when he passed away? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I, I think he was close to my age. Not exactly sure, but uh, he may have been a few couple of years or so younger. Can you, because he was he was visited uh, and asked specifically about a Cuban incident. Yeah. Can, can you could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, there was uh, there was some reporting about intercepted uh, broadcasts amongst uh, Cuban jet aircraft about a UFO sighting that that came through uh, 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 spies, essentially monitors of uh, old of radio classified radio broadcasts, and the information uh, was made available to research. I believe Stanton Friedman uh, uh, was put onto it. And eventually it, it made its way to Bob Todd and he looked at it and he decided to file a FOIA request. Now, the tricky thing about doing that is it, it involved the Cuban government, which is, or at the time was a hostile government to the U.S. And he, he had asked, I, I believe it was the FBI, whether or not it was okay to file a request to a foreign government for that kind of information. They, they said it was okay. So he did, and uh, a while later, he gets a visit from uh, two FBI agents uh, playing bad guy and good guy. Why did he do that? Why is he contacting Cuba? How did he get this information? They were grilling him as to uh, uh, what his purpose was in this, and he said he was just seeking out information on this story that, that came about, and... You know, they didn't tell him too much about what they knew about it, but they, they were trying to scare him, and he was scared. He didn't know what would happen to him. But uh, nothing did, ultimately. They didn't press the issue and all, and uh, uh, ultimately Bob uh, didn't get any concrete data from the Cubans about it, as, as if they were going to at all. But uh, it, it was a scary episode for him, and I think... Uh, in a way, it made him more bold to go after information uh, from that point on because it convinced him that they internally within these agencies took the subject seriously. Otherwise, they wouldn't send people out to question him about it like that, a personal visit from Uncle Sam. So uh, it, it pushed him along and, and made him push even harder to uh, uh, file documents and 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 requests to whoever he suspected had information on the subject. It included uh, uh, Air Force, Navy, Army, you, you name it. He's been into all of them. Wow. And, and that is, it's incredible. And there is a specific way, as all of you learned, that you have to file, you have to word your FOIA request so you'll get information. Yeah. And tell us how, I mean, if, if somebody out there wanted to file a FOIA request, what would be the key points that they would need to address? Well, it, I mean, it started where you needed to describe the documents you were seeking in, in reasonable detail, you practically had to know that an agency had something and it was dated at a certain time and and uh, certain individuals were involved and all. But it, it was it's far more stringent like that now than it was then. We, you had to know things. You had to know they had something, but uh, it was being used for the first time uh, in those years. So nobody really knew what all the borders and, and – uh, uh, restrictions were precisely. I mean, it was spelled out in nine exemptions in the law, and and some of it included national security, personal information about witnesses and individuals, and all. You couldn't release private people's data, and but in general, you could get facts on on what you were requesting. But uh, they would release wads of information that sometimes we weren't even asking for, and I I thought that was unusual. Over time, they tightened that and made people stick strictly to uh, uh, specific things on specific dates. And if you didn't have that, they didn't have to create a record to fulfill a request like that. In other words, they, they couldn't say, well, we knew about a document like that a long time ago, and I can confirm it happened. They wouldn't tell you things like that. You had to either get the document or you got nothing. So we worked under 
uh, the law that way, and and uh, things will be released, censored under one of the nine exemptions uh, that were uh, applied to these papers. And uh, each paper, I think each document would lead to more information. They'd raise more questions than uh, than we had before, and and sometimes the follow-ups would lead to new things that we didn't know about. So that's the way it was used. Now, the law has been watered down to the extent that uh, it takes a very, very long time to get answers. Uh, they've, they've cut staff, they've cut budgets within the agencies to respond to these things. I, government never really was fond of, of freedom of information. They'd, they'd rather keep everything secret if they could and not have to answer to it, but uh, this, they have to comply to, to requests, particularly by the press, as to uh, what government has done, how they're accountable to the public, and, and you know how they earn the money that uh, it's given them in taxes. You know, they have to justify their existence and what they're doing behind the scenes to deal with uh, questions and and information. So it's been watered down to the point where you just are frustrated in the amount of time it takes to receive answers. You file a request. There's no longer a, a firm 10-day uh, answering window that they used to do. Uh, now they have all the time in the world to respond, and it, sometimes it can take years. I know, I know some people, they have requests, and it's, it's taken a decade. They still haven't had answers. That is, that is, that's troubling. It's the way the government has evolved. Yeah, it, it's something should be done about it. But what? What can you do? What, what kind of pressure do you put on? It's got to be political pressure, and it, it's not there right now. Well, you're yeah, absolutely, and and I think something that people should know out there, if you've never done a FOIA request, I mean, it it costs money. These aren't necessarily free so right right they have a right to charge you professional time for looking things up and right yeah you know, and the deeper you go into the agency is i think the more that applies if you make general requests and all and they're, they're things that are really not highly classified they'll make paperwork available i think they allow sometimes allow 100 pages or so before they start charging you. But if it's a big wad of information, yeah, you can be sure to get charged about it. Right. And I, and I think, again, that just it speaks volumes of you and Jan Aldrich and everyone that has worked so hard to do this because it's not only your time, it's the, the financial commitment that you've made as well for all of our benefits. And I, I just think that that's very commendable. I, so. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, you know, I, I have letters in the files here, and I have Bob Todd's records uh, showing that checks were handed out regularly to pay for things. Oh, my gosh. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. I'm Erica Lukes here with Barry Greenwood. We are going to take our first break, and we will be right back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702 425 9230. That's 702 425 9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Paranormal Radio never sounded so good. Join the hosts of the American Ghost Hunter Show each week as they shoot from the hip without holding back. They're kind of unpredictable. Not like the rest of us. Live every Thursday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Right here on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Come hear some of the hottest authors, investigators, as well as TV and radio personalities from around the world. On the American Ghost Hunter Show. Our survival depends upon it. Hauntings, UFOs, cryptos. If it's branded paranormal, we'll be talking about it. The American Ghost Hunter Show. Live Thursday nights, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The only question you have to ask yourself, 
Are you ready for it? Yeah! All right! It's great. It's great. I think it's great. It's great. The all-new KCOR Digital Radio Network. Great. Make a note of it. It's great! The Fenton Files. Files. Where it's all connected. You see, whoever controls technology controls the world. Come explore a universe full of possibilities. Every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. The Fenton Files. Go where no other show has gone before. You can deny all the things I've seen, all the things I've discovered, but not for much longer. Because too many others know what's happening out there. Whether it be UFOs, aliens, conspiracies, or even consciousness, your host, Lorian Fenton, has a file for that. The Fenton File. The Fenton File. The Fenton File. Your journey to the truth is but a file away. Live, Monday nights, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The Fenton Files. Incredibly intense. The truth is just waiting to be discovered. Monday nights are about to become hauntingly good as Reverend Sean Whittington possesses the airwaves with Vegas Supernatural. Vegas Supernatural. Tune in every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern for Vegas Supernatural exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. There's a war raging between good and evil. The question is, which side are you fighting on? Tune in Monday nights as Reverend Sean Whittington sets the new standard for paranormal radio with some of the most influential personalities in the world today. Vegas Supernatural, hosted by Reverend Sean Whittington, every Monday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The one show even the devil doesn't want you to hear. You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes, where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chats at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back. I'm Erica Lukes. Always happy to be here on a Friday evening and to see all of my friends in chat and new friends. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for spreading information out about the show. I try to get the best people in in the world to come on the show to, to teach you and to give us information so we can carry this subject forward in a respectable manner. And I appreciate your support. I want to say if you need to find me, you can go to ufoclassified.com or go to my Facebook page, same thing, or find me at Erica Luke's. I have wonderful people sending me messages and case reports every day. I appreciate you doing that, and I will try my best to get you to good people. And this is it's it's a te- it's teamwork. My guest this evening is someone who has been very very dear to me and helpful to me and and a, a mentor. And I appreciate his work. And all of us should understand the importance of what he has done for decade after decade after decade. Barry Greenwood is here tonight, and you can go to Barry Greenwood Archives to see some of his collections and the newsletters, Just Cause, all of these great things that we can look back at and learn from. Barry has been relentless in his pursuit of truth with regard to the United States government and has done a lot of FOIA requests. And we were talking about that before our break. We were talking about when you're doing a FOIA request, the nine exemptions and how things over the years have changed and become much more difficult for a, a citizen to get information quickly, which is that, and that's, that's really too bad. 
Yeah, it, it's uh, it's a shame that it's deteriorated like that, but that, that's what happens, I think, over time when you start out with something new, with entropy sets in, and it goes from ordered to chaos, unless there's a constant vigilance at keeping it fresh and new. And it, it's not often you see within government uh, programs being kept fresh and new. It's almost as if they just let them deteriorate and 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 deal with the topic of the day instead of the overall uh, uh, government function. And FOIA has deteriorated badly. And that, that's too bad because it seems like our only hope, perhaps, to get truthful information. It's still a tool. It still does produce things uh, now and then, uh, depending on what you're asking for. Uh, a while back, I had requested an article about a missile incident off the coast of California uh, that was in a, uh, a magazine or a newspaper, rather, from a, a military base. And I didn't know what was going to come of it. I asked for it, and they very quickly got back to me and sent me a copy of the article around 1978 or so. And that was a, you know, a, a positive development. If it you're, you're more likely to have success if you're reasonably sure something is there. The more specific, the better. So uh, if you heard someone talking about particular documents and all, you're more likely to get success that way, rather than saying, send me everything you have. Because you, you won't get anything like that. And I have to, to ask you, we've got a couple questions that Libertas has, has asked in chat, and he wants to know, with if you submit a FOIA request or a series of them, does that target you? I think it depends on what you ask about. I, I gave you the example uh, of Bob Todd. Right. He asked about a very delicate situation involving a, an alleged UFO report involving Cuban jets. And, yeah, they followed up on that because of the nature of the request. They, they obviously knew that there was a real radio intercept because if it was uh, some rumor from a UFO magazine, the FBI is not going to bother with that. But there was a reason for them to visit Bob over that incident. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, they probably do watch people, uh, but in very specific instances, not, not just for general requesting. They, they wouldn't have the staff of the time to do that. I don't, you know, some people believe that it, there are whole floors in Washington in buildings devoted to UFO research and monitoring everybody. That's absolute nonsense. They don't have time for that. But if there's a reason to pay attention, then they do. It's just not very common. And so you, you we've been talking about Tom DeLong and to the Stars Academy and some of the the recent events that have taken place and as somebody who has lived through this and has seen this in, in many different forms, what tell us what your initial thoughts were when you saw this project coming to light. Oh, it was extraordinary. I mean, the initial coverage, I, I didn't know what to make of, of uh, you know, the, the publicity about it at first. The, the very first thing I think was the October presentation by two of the stars and, and there, there have been rumors for a while about uh, something like that coming out and there were going to be big revelations and all but we've, we've heard that all before uh, in, in the past I, I can't remember the number of times that i've heard those stories where big promises were made and they fell flat in their faces over time i, I recently said that uh, uh, ufo predictions like that haven't have an almost slightly better record than doomsday predictions, which, as you know, are 100% wrong. <laughs> so you, UFO predictions like that just don't often come out. But, you know, this seemed to have promise. You're, you're sitting there listening to it and saying, wow, this is quite impressive, assuming it's real. So uh, they, they they held the uh, the video conference in October and presented the panel and all, and some of the people we heard about before uh, helped put off and Chris Mellon and some we hadn't. So they seemed to be experts in their fields and, and it was very interesting that they were involved in it, but you know, the proof is in the pudding. Let's see the details. So 
then December comes around and, and suddenly there's a huge story in the New York Times. Someone sent me an email and said, you got to see the Times today. And I went out and found detailed, extraordinary detail about, uh, you know, an organization within the Pentagon that was functioning and monitoring uh, UFO reports. And it was called AATIP, which I never heard of before. And it stood for Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, run by a fellow named Louis Elizondo, who uh, was with the program for a number of years. And uh, as I read the article, I said, wow, I mean, this, this seems to be well-based, and especially the fact that the New York Times was reporting it. That really added some credibility to it, because the Times historically has been death on UFOs. They they went out of their way to knock it down, but uh, they seem to be impressed somewhat with, with the details being given to them by the reporters who uh, dug the story out and, and interviewed these folks. So then I paid attention to it, and for about the next two weeks or so, there was an extraordinary amount of press coverage about it, uh, around the world especially. Uh, the, the other countries picked it up. I, I found... Uh, write-ups in foreign languages I, I never saw before talking about this. So uh, it, it had an impact. And we find out that there's two videos uh, from aircraft associated with this. One that uh, uh, took place off of the Florida coast around the end of January of 2015. And that's been known as the gimbal video. And there's another video taken November 14th, 2004, and that's known as the Tic Tac video, and that was off the other coast near San Diego, involving the USS Nimitz. And at this point, uh, researchers are still trying to get details on these stories. Uh, we had the videos, and I think there was one report release giving details on the Tic Tac story, and the, the, one of the pilots surfaced and, and gave interviews about it, uh, uh, named Fravor. And he was on local channels here. He comes from New Hampshire, and they brought him down to Boston to interview him for a while, and he told an extraordinary story about uh, uh, these sightings of uh, multiple objects being picked up on radar, and then one of the aircraft, not his, but another aircraft had actually filmed uh, one of these Tic Tacs. So, impressive. I mean, I you know, I, I couldn't imagine that the story was going to flop this time. Uh, there seemed to be some substance to it. But, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you're saying, well, okay, you know, let's keep it going. Let's see what else happens. Is, are there going to be new releases of this? They seem to promise that because in the original coverage, they um, alluded to three videos. But so far, we've only seen two. And I don't know what's become of the third one. Apparently, it was some reason to hold it back or, or, or wait until more information developed. But, uh, you know, the world was watching. They wanted more. They, they were, their appetites were whetted. The press was waiting. They want new information on this and see the, the full story behind it. And they had reason to do that because in the Times write-up, they alluded to uh, reams of information, reams of paperwork that right. were developed. Also, they uh, talked about a 490-page book of UFO history. Well, that's significant, uh, you know. Let's see if we can FOIA that. We have something specific to ask about with, with these revelations. Uh, my understanding at the moment is that there's something like over 1,300 FOIA requests in on this story. You know, and that's, that's the nightmare for FOIA staff. Well, and, and that's, I mean, and, and I will say that perhaps that isn't the best plan of attack. <laughs> It, it would seem like it maybe it everybody could get together and then have somebody like you or John Greenwald well, who yeah, are I mean, familiar with not, this. That's not the way the world works, though. Everybody wants to get the, the scoop. Right. They think, well, I, if I file on it, and they have reason to believe that because of the thing I mentioned to you before about my own filing based on a tabloid and getting new things that other people were looking for but they couldn't get. 
That's interesting. Right, right. that is. So that everybody is. thinks that they're going to make the breakthrough. So that's why they're all storming in with, with FOIA requests. And that's obviously going to gum up uh, the, the staff responding to these things. I, I don't know of any real substantive FOIA releases on this story so far uh, based on any of those reports. Although, uh, as mentioned before, that there's behind the scenes uh, inquiries about, uh, especially about the videos and, and, you know, exactly what happened and, and, and when they happened uh, to try to pin down specifics on these things to determine whether these objects are really odd. Uh, the Tic Tac uh, video was rather interesting and clear and all, and I, I don't know what to make of that. The other gimbal video showed a banking object, a continuous bank. I was almost getting dizzy watching it. Uh, but it, it used a FLIR camera, uh, infrared detection. It, it didn't use a, um, a, a regular visual camera that you would use. And it, it presented a dark image uh, uh, showing that, that it was emitting heat, but uh, it, it the image flared to the point where I'm not sh- I'm not sure what the exact shape of the object was, and I think that's uh, uh, one of the tasks that investigators are trying to unravel exactly what did this thing look like, and also uh, where are the clear view videos rather than the infrareds? I mean, uh, the aircraft are equipped with normal cameras that could take nice shots of these things, but none of that was released. Interesting. So where is that? Where is the investigation from within the government? As more right. people, it just piles of, of seeming things to ask for here that that so far uh, we haven't been able to fulfill. You know, the the program itself began in two thousand and seven, and it went for a number of years till two thousand and twelve, and then the budget was cut. Uh, they had originally uh, begun serious research when they were funded to the tune of uh, almost $22 million from 2008 to 2011 to help their activities along. And, uh, you know, one Pentagon briefing, which the Times quoted, and apparently they saw, but we haven't seen yet, uh, had a quote in it uh, saying, what was considered science fiction is now science fact. That's an incredible remark in a government briefing. Absolutely, know. absolutely, and we've and I want to talk more about that in the article and dissect that. But I want to get uh, Libertas, who called in. Hopefully, he is still there. He yeah. is really uh, just an incredible. He sends me lots of good information. So, Libertas, are you still hanging in there? I'm still here, young lady. Oh, you are such a love. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks so for what? taking my call. Absolutely. I know you have amazing questions. So what what did you want to ask Barry? Well, first, I want to uh, uh, thank Barry for coming on. And second, sorry uh, to digress from good balloon talk. Um, Barry, I, I actually called to, uh, I thought I would utilize your expertise here. I have something um, that's been in my handy dandy notebook for years I'd like to attempt to find the document, but I'm not sure if I have enough for a FOI A request. Or I know the guy that started the X or UFO Festival, and he recommends I go to uh, one of my congressmen's office. So here's what I have. This was uh, during the Reagan administration from 81 to 89. Mm. The House Science and Technology Subcommittee uh, released a report titled Physics of Consciousness. And there's a statement in there that says the general recognition of the degree of interconnectedness of minds could have far-reaching social and political implications for this nation and the world. That's pretty heavy stuff, but that's all I have. I can't find any additional information. Would I be better off going to one of my congressmen's office and having maybe one of their assistants try to find the document? Or do you uh, feel it, I have, it, have enough data? Uh, well, it, it, th- is that information from a transcript of the House hearing you have? No, I don't have the, the House uh, the House uh, Science and Technology Subcommittee report. I just know that's the name of the report they released. Yeah, so you should be. Consciousness. 
Yeah, I, I mean, if that's accurate, you should be able to request it from uh, the Congress. They they have a research library there that uh, they're supposed to keep everything that's submitted as evidence. Uh, so in you hearings. think I'd be better off going to my uh, a congressman's office yeah. versus submitting yeah, that, an FOIA? Yeah, well, the congressman's office would be the first place I'd go because often they can get those things without having to go through FOIA process. It doesn't sound like a classified document. I mean, you should be able to get it. Yeah, and, I mean, well, based on uh, what I read, that would uh, be a mind blowing document to obtain, in my yeah. in my opinion, anyway. So, well, yeah, you have I, a title, you have a location where it was presented, you have a date, a time frame when it was presented. That that should be enough to to get it even without for you. So like, even though it's between your, 81 your and 89, which is, you know, an eight year yeah. time span, that's sufficient. You feel. Uh, all right. You don't know then exactly when the hearing happened. No, all I know was during the Reagan administration. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, did you try looking on the internet to see if there was a title like that available somewhere? Yeah, I haven't been able to. Uh, I haven't had much luck on the internet. Yeah, finding yeah. Uh, finding out additional information. Yeah, well, I mean, I I can try for you, uh, uh, short of you know actually writing to the congressman. I'd still do that to get your local congressman there and and bounce it off them in a letter, and uh, you know they'll they'll look into it for you. Okay, they usually so, well, usually, I'll, they usually I'll try you that an answer. Yeah, they, they usually give you an answer in a reasonable amount of time. It's not for you. So, you know, you're a constituent and you're looking for legitimate information and, and see what happens. And, you know, if they, they can't find it, there are many other means to look it up. I, I find a lot of things through Internet connections now. And if I can't find them there, I just use hard copy connections. See what uh, uh, congressional hearings occurred and what the subjects were. They, there should be an archive of that. Yeah, well, there's a good one, and unfortunately, uh, she's not going to run again. And I've met her before, and she's wonderful. So I mm. think I will go to her, make an appointment, and go talk to us. Uh, yeah, on I, her I, staff. yeah. I mean, you you have enough there. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you for the recommendation. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the call, Erica. Absolutely. Thanks for all of your all of your information that you're sending me. I appreciate it. No worries. Take care. Take care. So thank you, Barry. I, it's it's important because there's so many people out there that want to become active, you know, and want to do FOIA requests and want to get information from from their government, you know. Well, and they, they, yeah, there are a zillion ways to find information. It's just you know you have to get a library of that in your head over time and and hit them all when the, 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 there's a call for it. Absolutely. And and with with regard to, because I know I've talked to Paul, both of you, before about how to word specific things. Before we go to break, can you tell us when you're wording things and requesting information, do you use the word UFO? We, we had a little debate over that in recent times. It was a, a long period where I, I wouldn't use the term because it had that taint of dirt to it, uh, to government. And, uh, you know, if they saw the term, they would just say uh, another UFO request. But then a few years ago, we ran into uh, research about Vietnam and found out that UFO was used all through Vietnamese uh, or, or government Vietnam documents reporting on uh, incidents uh, uh, within military bases. And they, that's the exact term they used. So, you know, I said, well, it looks like we have to use it again. And uh, I, I guess really there's no uh, uh, particular guideline for that, considering what they did in Vietnam. They were supposed to stop using the term, and they didn't. They did it quietly so nobody could see, but it was still I, – I suppose it was such a popular term that uh, they didn't have to explain what was going on with other newly made-up terms, so they stuck with UFO. That's interesting. And and when – you know, I, I – I always think about Keith Chester and the Foo Fighters and all of the work that he did at the National Archives. I mean, did you, how did do you know how he, when he was doing FOIAs or things, or when he was going through and requesting specific documents? Do you know how he worded that? He didn't file too many FOIA. I think he he 
uh, recovered most of the paperwork through just going there and digging it out of boxes. Uh, he ended up with something like three bankers boxes full of uh, a variety of uh, uh, Army, Air Force, and, and uh, uh, other kinds of reports discussing aerial phenomena, mostly bomber missions, uh, fighter missions over Europe, and then later in, uh, in the Pacific. And there was a variety of uh, terminology there to use as well. Uh, years ago, I had requested documents on Foo Fighters, and, and I was told by the archives they couldn't find any. And I went down in 1992 to do on-site research, and one day I was just having no luck at all. And the last box I requested was a World War II uh, uh, night fighter squadron uh, set of records and I, I dig out it, it, it was a two foot box but there were 15 documents in it and several of them actually mentioned Foo Fighters so their, their pronouncements to you about what they can and can't find aren't always well grounded you have to go uh. yourself that's the way you for sure will get answers to what you're looking for you just paw through the boxes and that, I will say, takes a lot of dedication and hard work. And it, it's, you know, too bad that people who care about this subject spend more time engaging in Facebook banter than they do actually going down to their library or, you know, talking to an elected official or looking through archives. And and I think we really need to kind of reframe the way we're, we're dealing with this subject if well, we're going to make I, a good change. I, I have some bad news for internet fans. Not everything's on the internet. <gasps> There's an awful lot of stuff not there, and you have to go and dig it out. And sometimes that's better than anything you could find on the internet. You're going to break a lot of people's hearts. <laughs> I know, but they have to be brought down sometime. <laughs> A lot of lazy people who, I mean, honestly, it, it, it's, and that's, it's funny to me to, I know we've got one minute to break, but I just have to say it is funny that these, these people in the UFO community like to spend a lot of time on Facebook thinking that's going to solve, solve the riddle. And it really won't. It takes a lot of research, a lot of hard work like you have done, like Jan, Keith Chester. And we, I want to talk a little bit about the Foo Fighters and everything that you did with regard to that when we get back. I'm Erica Lukes here with Barry Greenwood. We are taking a break and we will be back. Listen very carefully. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. Now, broadcasting in digital HD radio. This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. The rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the software. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Welcome back and happy Fantopia Friday. I hope all of you are warm. I hear that there is a big storm brewing. We're supposed to be getting something here in Utah, but apparently not. We'll wait and see. I want to, again, thank everybody in chat for being there, for asking questions, and my listeners from all over the world. I appreciate your support 
and all of your messages. It means a lot to me, and I hope that we can create something positive and give good information out and really change the field and give it the respect it deserves. I am here with somebody who has spent his entire life giving the subject the respect it deserves and digging in. Barry Greenwood is here. You can go to Barry to Greenwood ufoarchive.com to see what he has there all of his archives publications including cal flop quarterly just cause the new and old series rockmore's flying saucer review ufo historical review and i i have gone through that and found very interesting things that help me with my own research you can see the inventories all of this good stuff so Barry welcome back and thank you again for being here it is it's really an honor to have someone like you on the show well thank you I don't do radio shows very often do they still call this radio or what is it now I think so internet ra- I don't know what we're calling internet, it. internet radio I don't yeah. do it that often and you know, I, I did more radio shows in the past, especially when Clear Intent came out. But lately, you know, it's just like they haven't done it. So this is a break for me to do it. I pre- I appreciate that. And I know you, you haven't done that. And I don't blame you because when you look around, you don't see I, – I mean, there are a lot of radio show hosts that don't necessarily understand the importance of the subject – yeah, and and so I I I love it, and I care about it, and I really thank you for being here. I did have a couple of more comments regarding the uh, the Pentagon releases in December. I, uh, a few things I just wanted to make sure were mentioned. That one of your your listeners uh, asked about the threat identification program that uh, Elizondo was involved with, and and uh, they that apparently was all from military sources. They would get their intelligence from whoever was reporting within government and, and receive the reports and process them, analyze them. We haven't seen any of how that's done yet uh, until they decide they're going to declassify or make it available. But apparently all of the sources came from within government, within the military. I can't say exclusively because perhaps uh, a political figure had a sighting somewhere and they they could report through quiet channels. But I think it's intended to be military by and large. And uh, also, uh, one of the people who's been on the story very early on was Robert Powell, who was a former research director uh, for MUFON. I think he resigned last year, but... Uh, He's been on the Tic Tac story from uh, quite a while back, and I I think he's probably one of the earliest people to file FOIA requests. He sent in nine requests to uh, the Navy and and Marine groups on the West Coast, and, and he hasn't had many positive responses, but he was able to get the deck logs of the USS Nimitz out. That was the sighting in 2004. And it doesn't seem to mention anything about UFOs within that time frame, but that's not unusual for deck logs. I think it's it's mostly operational stuff that gets into those. And UFO reports don't necessarily have to get into ships' deck logs. It can be mentioned elsewhere. So it's it's not unusual if if you think an incident happened for sure and it doesn't show up. We've had other examples in the past where ship's logs didn't show sightings that were pretty certain happened. But he he did get uh, uh, some emails where one person, a a major, admitted that he remembered the Tic Tacs case. So that sort of added to, you know, the, the reality of the event actually happening, that it was talked about in that context as Tic Tacs uh, within government. And uh, at, you know, there might be questions about those videos and how they surfaced. Uh, apparently Elizondo used a, a, uh, a Defense Department office which uh, does this it does this type of thing. They review uh, potentially classified material. It's called the Defense Office of Prepublication and Security Review. It's it's a place where, say, uh, a CIA guy or an ex-retired government person might write a book 
know, produce a manuscript and talk about government matters, but they'd have to clear the information through an office to, to make sure it's okay to talk about it, and that's the office where it goes to. So Elizondo did that, and he used the DD Form 1910 to have the two videos uh, made available. And that right now, uh, Paul Dean is requesting those requests and anything yeah. behind them under FOIA. So uh, that's more or less recent developments about that story. And that's good. And I mean, I've I've watched Paul and, and some of the social media postings, and it, it's been very interesting to see in quote unquote ufology or the, the factions on Facebook that mm. we like, you know, <laughs> people, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, getting in there and, and, you know, this, I am the authority authority on this because I spend all my time on Facebook and I mean, mm. it, it's just ridiculous. And, and then, you know, I can see Paul and some of his postings saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we're really, we are actually doing the work on this. And I know that Robert Powell has been been incredible and i i think the world of robert oh yeah he's fabulous as a researcher i, I i'm just totally impressed with him he's good he's helped me on a, a few cases and i appreciate his you know his willingness to help which is important to me i think a lot of times you get people who've been in the subject for a long time who don't want to share information or don't want to reach out and that I can understand that after you get burned out, but it's also important to share that knowledge and to help people learn. Well, I've, I've noticed that uh, uh, people like yourself and others now really bring the hammer down on, on folks that keep information secret. And, and there's a growing uh, dissent at, at doing that and keeping information that should be out as confidential and just never giving any details of something. That, that's done by a lot of folks to keep attention on themselves where they don't have to provide any substance, but they just make promises and they're the object of Facebook and other postings and they, they're popular for a long period of time. So uh, but there, there has to be a lot of criticism of, of those actions if it's unjustified. Absolutely. And, and that's, I mean, and I understand that, you know, you get, you have, a, you have a life, you spend your life researching things, you've got boxes and boxes of papers, and it's hard to scan and get them out there. But at least when somebody re makes an effort to contact you and say, hey, can I just spend five, 10 minutes to learn from you? I mean, I think that that's, to me, no matter how old I am, I would always want to help somebody who had a vested interest in carrying my work forward. And I think that's truly important. And, you know, with regard to people kind of hoarding data, when I was in Norway and I was having many candid conversations with Erling Strand, who is also one of my heroes in this field, I mean, he said, you know, you, you don't make progress by keeping things a secret. And he said, we don't do that and it wouldn't, you know, basically when we look at what happens in the United States, that's what's going on over there. And that's not the way progress is made. Well, when you have a compartmentalized story where a few people know about it, no one else, and they're looking for answers within that compartment and they can't get them very well, it behooves them to go public somewhat with it so that they can get other eyes looking at it uh, that may have had more experience with what they're investigating. Uh, so that you can enhance the detail. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Robert Powell came up with regarding the, uh, the original pilot report from the Nimitz was that uh, they noticed that the water down below underneath uh, this Tic Tac thing was boiling and roiling uh, uh, quite a bit. And apparently there was some effect on the water. I had come across, when he told me that, I remembered information from some years ago. I had seen a video of, uh, 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 I think it was from a weather forecast, where they were doing a story on this whirlpool that suddenly appeared off the Southern California coast. And it was really weird. They were actually wondering if it was a UFO. And this was years before the Tic Tac thing. So I, I mentioned it to Robert, and I, he said, "Yeah, that's really odd, isn't it?" And you know, and it comes up in this story. So where did where did these whirlpools come from? Is that a normal feature of the ocean at, at 
in those areas or is it something that just off and on it spontaneously happen and you just don't know the reason for it it's odd that it's associated with the the strange tic-tac thing in the ear but yeah i I just wonder if they actually photograph that or if if they did they're just withholding it it would be a tragedy if they did that but i can't imagine that they'd let that go uh, without a picture right so who knows we gotta wait and see again wait and see Need, need more details so do you think, you know, with with this, do you think that over the years, have you seen any factions within the government that might have a vested interest in swaying the sentiment or pushing information to suit their needs? Oh, the government people are like regular people. You have people who believe in UFOs and you have people that are utter total skeptics and some of them are in the middle. They're like anyone else, except they have better information from which to draw. So when someone within government says that, uh, you know, they saw some extraordinary information and all, it, gets, it catches your attention. You want to pay attention to it. But there are also government people that are off the wall. And you have to, uh, through uh, continuing inquiries, find out if what they're saying is true or not. A classic example of that is MJ-12. And, and the people that were within government then that were passing the story along, and it was it was clearly hokey. I'm thinking of uh, someone like Richard Doty, for example. He, he was a, a, a an agent within OSI, the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations, and he that was legitimate. But he, he uh, apparently was launching fake material out of that position over a period of time. And that's what evolved into the MJ-12 story with the help of others. And so he is back in the game again as we well, see yeah, by I, social I, I, media. He's, yeah. he's, on the, he's on Facebook, I hear. I don't, I'm not on Facebook myself, but people are telling me he's uh, quite present out there and, and talking about that and, and Project Serpo and others that, you know, just bad stories. But somehow he has a personal interest in continuing this. I can't imagine that AFOSI would have Doty get involved in a program uh, to release and promote MJ-12 as a disinformation campaign. And then decades after he's retired, he's still doing it. Is he getting a government check for that? Is he still carrying out a 40-year-old program on ufos where there's not an ounce of paperwork documenting that at all that that uh, retired employees continue to do this work unpaid uh, for free just for the fun of it go on facebook and talk about it i don't think so. i think there's a, a more of a personal interest in doing that it has nothing to do with government it gets right. you at- it gets you attention right and I think that's what's behind it. That's my opinion. Well, I think you have a very good opinion. And it, that it is interesting. And I think people need to, to be aware of some of these people in the field or people that are coming back in and out. And it, it's just, it's also curious. I want to ask you what, what your take is and what you've experienced over the years with regard to Bigelow. Well, I haven't had contact with Bigelow. I, he's never... Uh, I don't think he's ever needed any advice or comments or anything from me. I know he's dealt with other people. He helped fund uh, Jan Aldrich in his project 47 years ago, which was great because uh, Jan was able to travel the country, actually the continent, Canada and and the United States, stopping by archives and collecting uh, as much information as he could on the year 1947, which was the first big UFO wave. We knew that there was a great deal of information out there on it, but we were limited as to the scope of what we could do. I I did what I could in New England and Jan worked on Connecticut, but we needed a a more broad view of of what happened uh, continent-wise. That that wave was largely U.S. and and, uh, a little bit later Canada. Canada didn't have it in a big way, but they had a bleed over from what happened here so uh we wanted to get 
the whole picture on that, and that was the purpose of the visit. Jan would travel, collect uh, press coverage and whatever else he could find, and he'd send it to me, and I'd cut it all down and mount it and process it so it looked good on paper. It didn't have a lot of uh, you know other stories uh, hiding the, the sometimes small UFO reports that would come out. So we, we made it pretty, and, and uh, that uh, turned into a big project 1947 report on the wave and it was it, it drew from much more information than the original write-up that ted blocher did in 1967 called the report on the ufo wave of 1947 he had 800 sources jan had thousands so uh, bigelow funded that and uh, that was great that worked i think bigelow was trying to uh, help out in documenting the subject uh, early on, but his uh, his interest grew over time, and he had the the resources to be able to do more uh, with the subject than any of us could, and uh, you know that uh, led into this new effort uh, to the stars and and what they're doing, trying to analyze the subject the the ufo metal thing is curious the the times reported on how bigelow uh received a great deal of the funding that that harry reed had provided through uh, uh black budget money and he used some of that to refurbish buildings on his facility to to analyze and store ufo metals i hear there have been stories about some metals that are rather exotic uh, uh, that have been recently discussed, but of course, no details again. But, uh, you know, back when I in, uh, went to Kufos last August to try to scan some of the materials, part of what I did at the request of a researcher was connected to that to uh, look for um, artifact reports, metals. And uh, some cases were popular and some I hadn't heard of very well. So I looked and I, I couldn't find anything. Kufos didn't seem to have anything uh, substantive in terms of artifacts. I, I did see one box there on the Delphos, Kansas soil samples, big, pretty big box. But that was the only thing that I had noticed. And I reported back on it and said so I, I couldn't come up with anything on these artifacts. But it, it, it was clearly connected to what Bigelow was doing. And uh, they were they were actively looking for metals. In, in uh, 2010, around 2010, 2011 or so, MUFON, you recall, had a star team. And Bigelow financed that to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars. You can see that in their tax returns. They had a sudden dramatic uptick in money coming in over right. se several months. And that effort was also, I think, designed to find uh, cases involving artifacts so they could get raw material to work on to see if they could prove something with it. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't happen in the time frame it was funded. There were no cases like that. I think they had one case involving a, a, an auto effect, an EM effect, but that, that, I think it was the most dramatic one they had. And uh, the, the funding was stopped after a period of time, so... And do you know if that that case uh, that MUFON investigated with Bigelow did that ever make it out into the public? I see. I'm not a MUFON member, so I don't get okay. the journal. I'm not sure, but if if there's an auto effects case around that time that's reported in the journal, then that might be the one. I don't okay. know specifically what it is. I know that it was a case. I, Robert Powell probably can say more about it. Okay, but he, he was inside at the time. Yeah, that would be. Great to to know that. Um, have you have you had Paul on? Uh, I have you? twice. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I d I adore him, and I will I will bring him back, and I will ask him because he j I have so much respect for him. Oh yeah, you have to talk to him, especially now because he's at the the spear tip of uh, research on these videos. Okay, and that's a great idea. I will reach out to him and get him on. He's he is he's very dedicated and very thorough, and I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, he's he's been great. Uh, he, he gave MUFON credibility that they don't seem to have much anymore. You know, they they don't. That was I think that was a very sad day when Robert left MUFON when he resigned, and yeah. I think that's a big that was a big big resignation, a big loss. 
yeah, well, they, they need to rethink their TV shows uh, rather than Hangar One and programming like that, which I think outraged ufologists rather than inform them. Well, again, yeah, absolutely. I think there's there are a lot of things about MUFON that need to be addressed, which I, I bring up when I have different guests. But, I mean, definitely hiding data or not being forthright with the public when somebody like Bigelow comes in and offers to, to help fund things. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that they could, if they were, if they had people that were really adept at marketing or adept at uh, research or things, things like that, that they could, they could make move on a great organization. And I, I wish that that would happen. I don't foresee that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't, in, in, in a general sense, I can't criticize the effort they're going to. I mean, it may be seen as space cadet stuff in some respects uh, you know, with two of the stars, but I think in general, if, if you have information that's suggestive of something really odd, uh, whether it's a natural phenomenon or something artificial, and these guys seem to think it's artificial intelligence of some kind, it's, it's not from here, that they've pretty much expressed that openly, then it needs to be investigated. And, and Mr. Bigelow having a lot of money like that uh, is sinking funds into it and it's great i mean to to try to get to the core of these things i just hope it doesn't get colored by uh, belief in certain Amen. areas where it's not justified so yeah you know, keep, keep, keep it neutral and keep it scientific and and uh, don't color it with uh, the personal beliefs and they can go a long way but you know it there's two aspects to this it's a it's a research yeah. effort one and it's also a business effort, too. And I think the business effort needs some help because uh, you want to, when you start something like this, you're soliciting donations and funds trying to get these projects going. Uh, you need to show people that it's legitimate. Absolutely. And, and I'm again, I want to talk a bit more about that. We're going to break. I can hear that music. This is our last break for the evening. Stick around. Willie Miranda has his new show after my show. I'm here with Barry Greenwood. We will be back after these messages. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network after this. Here's what happened on the last episode of Three Guys No Ties. I have a sore shoulder and it's been killing me for the last two days. Like, actually on my back. And this right along the line of the scapula. It's been killing me. I don't know if I slept weird or something, but it's been in constant se severe pain. Uh, I, I'm thinking maybe I just need a, a big Swedish lady to stick her elbow in there and and work it out. So I'm not sure the little Chinese lady is really going to be. Oh, no. Dude, trust me. They'll beat the crap out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. Three Guys, No Ties. Wednesday nights, 7 to 9 Pacific, on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Listen up, everyone. Right, now, this is the world-famous KCOR. That's the only station I listen to. Friday night, 9 p.m. Pacific. Jump onto the celestial highway and travel at the speed of light into hyperspace. 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 Hosted by Solaris Blue Raven. She navigates you through the cosmic tides of mysticism into the world of covert technology, UFOs, mystical sciences, and the world of unforeseen forces. You get to really sort of enjoy a bizarre ride. Listen live. Friday night, 9 p.m. Pacific. For hyperspace. The one show that blows the whistle off our government black ops projects. Hyperspace. Hosted by Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris Blue Raven. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Wanna take a ride? Take a ride. Take a ride. There is a world outside that which we live in a realm where fact and fiction collide 
The Paradigm Matrix. The Paradigm Matrix. Hosted by Willie Miranda. Every Friday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. The one-hour show that will surely leave you hanging on the edge of the rabbit hole. The Paradigm Matrix. Explores a universe of topics from UFOs, cryptozoology, conspiracies, as well as all things paranormal. Enter a world of the twisted and deformed. Friday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Paradigm Matrix. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Where fact and fiction collide. You're listening, you're listening to You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. I knew this was going to be an amazing show and one for the memory books. I'm here with Barry Greenwood, who is, in my opinion, the foremost archivist in the world with regard to UFOs. He has spent his entire life dedicated to finding old archives from researchers who are getting ready to throw them in the trash. He has reached out to many different people and collected these these important works. He's helped preserve their memories, their research, and he is helping all of us keep their memories alive and to continue on studying and learning from what they have accomplished. And I think that is such a big, that is a big uh, feet. I can't, and Barry, I, I mean, I, I honestly, in every lecture that I give, I mention you and the importance of your work and Jan and Fran Ridge and all of the people that you associate with. And people don't, don't, they need to realize what you have done, especially the younger generation. Yeah. I, I urge people if they have records, they want to get rid of, if they have records, they don't want to get rid of, but uh, would scan them because it's no good having something unique in your in your hands that no one else can see. And if anything happens to you, it's long gone. It's finished. It's done. Nobody ever sees it again. And you don't want that uh, to pass out of sight. So that uh, uh, scanning should be done in this subject uh, by anyone who has important materials related to the subject so we can save it and make sure other people know that that work was done and that individual existed and did uh, something positive. And, and, and I will say if we can, if I can put out a message like you, Barry, we've talked about this before and you did a little a video interview with me that I played at UFO Congress last year. But if you can reach out each of us in your own community and try to make inroads with people that have been researching the area and that have archives that are in all likelihood getting ready to be donated or thrown in the trash, then please, please do that. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, I think a uh, story about Ray Fowler who to longtime researchers uh, is well known in my opinion, he should be well known anyway as a, as a classic investigator from uh, New England. And, uh, you know, he's, he's in his 80s now, and he felt he had to downsize his holdings because he's, he's advanced in age, and he wanted to pass along uh, his records. Now, years ago, when he more or less retired from the subject and went to Maine uh, as his retirement home, uh, he uh, handed over his files to me, his case files from the early 60s through the 80s, and and he didn't know what he was going to do with them. He, he was talking about selling them off, and who knows where they would have ended up. Uh, it could have been someone completely anonymous or someone overseas. It, it just it was very risky, so I made the effort to try to keep them in New England 
so at least uh, New Englanders and, and everyone else could uh, consult them. And um, he's, he's downsizing again, but it's the last of his materials. He wants to make sure they go somewhere. And he sent his scrapbook of his life on the subject. He had given lectures over the years. He had appeared in feature articles in the newspapers. And uh, uh, he wanted to make sure that scrapbook uh, survived. So he sent it down to me. And, and so I could give it safekeeping and have it duplicated and it, it doesn't become uh, lost in the cracks of history. And uh, that's great. And that's what everybody has to do if they're going to exit the subject in one manner or another, just make sure they, that part of them survives. Absolutely. And, and it, it breaks my heart to know that a family or people that have been around a person wouldn't, want to preserve that and i guess everybody has their own agenda in life yeah but. i mean you know uh you know, families they, they have uh, you know different attitudes about it some uh, with regard to this subject anyway some like it and some aren't fond of it and some don't care and and it does take up space for sure i you know just ask me i'll tell you it <laughs> takes up space uh, but they uh uh, it's often families don't want to keep it over a long period of time and they want to just send it somewhere or if not, they'll just toss it. They'll throw it in the trash. I can tell you too many horror stories like that, but enough is saved so that it's encouraging to just keep people thinking that way that, you know, don't think there's no interest in this because there is, you just have to know where to go with it. So tell us a horror story about, archives that could have been saved that weren't oh yeah there's one uh, i won't name him because it still involves family but he was a new england investigator years ago and uh, he made a habit of collecting his sighting reports by picking up hitchhikers and interviewing them asking them if they ever saw ufos now, some people might think that's pretty dangerous sometimes because you don't know if the hitchhiker is going to bop you on the head and take your car. But that's what he did. And he would write the information on scraps of paper and whatever was available to him in the car or wherever he was picking this person up. And then he would take the scraps to the meetings, the UFO meetings that they would have years ago. And he would talk about the sighting reports based on those scraps he collected from these hitchhikers. And it, you know, it kept the organization fresh and new because he, of all the new data he was getting from uh, all these sources, it, as odd as it is, they were sighting reports and these people were serious about it. So he saved all that. And, uh, then as time went along, he became ill and uh, he was hospitalized, and it, it was pretty apparent he wasn't going to live too much longer. So uh, an arrangement was made with his wife to, if anything happened to him, that uh, we would go down and pick it up. So, you know, we waited, and eventually he died. And uh, I think about two weeks went by, and we contacted his widow, and asked, you know, is it all right if we come down? I, we're sorry about him and, and that he passed on and all. And we just want to make sure his memory goes on. And she says, no, I threw it out. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, uh, is there a reason for it? Because we we're going to take it off your hand. She said, he spent so much time and effort and money on this subject and not paying enough attention to me and my family that I was going to get back at him and I destroyed it all. And it was destroyed. And all that survived were some photocopies that a few people had made from these meetings where they, they borrowed the slips of paper and all and photocopied them and kept them in their files. And eventually I was able to uh, see what they were. And some of them were handed over to me, and I said, oh, my, this is his scrapbook, his, his scraps of paper. One of the sightings had to do with a hitchhiker he picked up in New Hampshire back in 1965, where I don't know how many people recall this, the Exeter story, but there was, there was a wave of sightings 
at that time. This was in September 65. And John Fuller wrote about it in his book, Incident at Exeter. And one of the people who uh, had reported, but they were never identified, was a person who was calling the police station from a phone booth, panicked in having seen uh, this UFO or one of them that was in the area at the time. And, and Fuller was told about it by the uh, police department. And the person who described on the scrap of paper to this investigator uh, talked about going to a phone booth and they were so f afraid uh, that they, they almost couldn't walk. They were so frightened by the UFO. They c went to a phone booth and called the police. That person apparently was picked up by this investigator and interviewed, and we knew nothing about it for decades. Now we have the scrap of paper talking about it. That's incredible. That is incredible. I mean, it, it, and just to hear, like, every time I talk to you and you tell me these these stories, the pancake story, I mean, I'll, you've got so many things that you have preserved and, and found, and it's just like you, I, I really, well, in your free time, if you could write a book and do a, a documentary, that'd be great. <laughs> oh, I already did a book. <laughs> well, okay, but the, you know, that was 84, come on now. <laughs> we need something more current. I, you know, I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and come out and, and do an interview with you and help you do some scanning. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, we, we might be getting a good scanner pretty soon. So uh, hopefully. I, I think Paul might be coming to visit. Uh, he's coming from 10,000 miles away. But if he has the opportunity, he says he's going to come by and work on these things. And, and so how can people help you? Uh, the biggest help, you know, I'm, I'm not one to go barking for money or anything, donations and all. That's always needed by everybody. But one thing they can do, please, just if you have records, uh, photocopy them or scan them and send them along. If you don't want to give up the originals, a copy will do. A scan costs nothing. It's just the work to do it. And you have a nice image. But... Uh, Make sure what you have that's unique on the subject uh, uh, gets elsewhere so that there's a safe haven for them. And uh, the more, the better. The more copying, the more duplicates there are, the better. Because if they're everywhere, then they'll never get lost totally, like the old APRO files that vanished years ago. Uh, we don't know where they are. They're, they're, we hope they're safe. I, I we have suspicions maybe as to where they are, but nothing concrete. But that, that has to be prevented. We can't let something like that happen again. Uh, contact uh, Project 47, contact Erica Lukes, me, anyone else that could channel that kind of information along somewhere where it just will be archived. And we know where it is and it's safe and people can enjoy it years later, long after you're gone. And, and that is important. And I want to say that, you know, sometimes we've got researchers that donate things to universities. So tell us what, why that would or wouldn't be a good idea. Well, uh, it, it, sometimes it works and, and sometimes it doesn't work very well. Uh, you know, if, if someone's a, a, a graduate of a university, the university often uh, preserves their papers, if, especially the more prominent the person, the more likely they are to do that. They can't take everything, obviously. They don't have shelf space, but uh, th they have done that. And they, 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 like Ohio State, I believe, does that. They have a nice little collection and all. It's not unlimited, though, so you have to be careful what you pass along. If you, you tell a, a university somewhere that y you have three rooms full of stuff, they're probably going to say, forget it. But uh, you know, if you have a, a modest amount of material, they're more likely to accept it. Now, the downside of that is what I ran into uh, locally here at Boston University, where John Fuller's papers were donated to what was known then as the 20th Century Archives. And it's downtown Boston, and, and it's a special facility that preserves 20th century everything. Uh, celebrities, professors, and, and so on. If you're prominent, you know, they'd like to have your stuff. I don't know what their current policies are now as far as accepting things, but they took Fuller's papers. And it wasn't a huge amount of material. It was his manuscripts for Interrupted Journey and, and Incident at Exeter and some of the documentation behind them and 
and things about his books and all. So I went down there one day. You have to, this is a white glove place where you have to put archive gloves on and go through things. So I, I went through the material and it was interesting. I, I picked a, a selection of things out uh, to copy and they, they did that and all. But I, what, what I found out was the archive had a policy where they only do something like 20 pages of copies out of a collection like that for life. I said, wait a minute, for life? What do you mean? I can only do 20 copies ever? And yeah, that's it. The thinking behind that was that uh, they don't want people handling this stuff all the time and photocopying it all the time because it'll get dog-eared and messed up and chemicals from your hands will get on them and all. And uh, But I said, how can anyone do work like that if you need a large amount of, of what is in the archive? And they said, well, we can't. <laughs> so in that case, the, the, the collection was donated, but it's – just about utterly off limits unless you just you want to go there with a pencil and write down everything you see because you, you you can't take any more than a small amount of uh, copied material out they won't even do scans they won't let you do uh, a, a digital camera you can't use a digital camera you're not even touching the documents with that you're just taking a picture of it but the light from it spoils the document according to the archive so okay. that, that's their policy it's incredible. So with, with I know that Dave Marler has an extensive collection and he's dedicated or he is he is giving that to the university. I mean what it he Well, it, yeah, it depends I guess on on the policies they have. You may have a good relationship with them and good luck on that. That'd be great if they're available. I, I you know, I encourage it to be done if you're sure that there isn't restrictive uh, crazy policies put on. You have to check first, make sure and it sounds to me because I've asked him that, you know, and it sounds to me like he's got something really good in place. And I hope that's the truth because he, right. I mean, I mean, absolutely wouldn't. I mean, I hope that that comes into fruition because yeah. I think yeah. he has got such a beautiful archive. Yeah. He, I was on a, a video link with him one time. He was showing me around his room with these fabulous framed full page headlines from newspapers about, flying saucer reports from the past. It was so cool. He, I love Dave. He is incredible. And, and you helped him with the, the uh, battle of LA. Yeah. Years ago, geez, I think this was right at the dawn of the FOIA. Um, one of the things I thought of at the time, I, I had seen pictures of uh, the, this battle of LA with the searchlights and these round lights in the sky seemingly illuminated by the searchlights and i was fascinated with it and i, I said oh, gee i could use the FOIA to request uh, some of these documents related to that i'm sh sure that they saved battle of la records from that time and and lo and behold they did they had uh, they had uh, anti-aircraft battery units histories talking about the uh, the shootings that were going on how many shells were launched and how many came down in the neighborhoods and blew up accidentally hurting people and property and all. It, it was great, but we, we did acquire quite a bit of that material. And, and uh, I, I kept it in the folder here for years. And, and Dave had mentioned that uh, he was interested in that story. It was fascinating to him. I said, oh, I, I have a folder full of it from years ago. So I passed it along to him. And uh, I, I, hopefully it saved him a lot of time doing research because some of those documents are not very available anymore, I would imagine. Uh, when they photocopied them at the archives, they were done badly. It, it, they were faded. And I had to run them through Photoshop just to get them bold again. Because that's the way copies were in those days. They were imperfect. But, you know, the, the file was done, and, and I'm, I'm glad he was able to make use of it. Well, that's, and not, I, that's not the end of it either. I mean, there's all kinds of files from that time frame that uh, need to be done. It's just I need the time to do it. Well, and you need you need the help. And that's the thing. I just I every time I talk to you, I I cannot believe what you do. For one human being, and, and Jan Aldrich, and you know, uh, there there are a handful of people in your group 
that do what you have done and they care to preserve history. And it, it, it's it, at some point in time, the younger generation has to realize that people need to get in there and help you and get the word out and carry the torch. Well, people may not realize they might be saving our lives because there may be such a thing as drowning in paper. And Jan yes. and I and others may just literally drown in paper and not survive the, the research effort. <laughs> well, and, and there is the, the point that you need to, you all of you need to enjoy your, your life, too. I mean, you, you have made tremendous sacrifices. So I, I would, and please tell Jan that, and I will tell Jan that I would love to get him on the, sh the show and Michael Swords and people that I think need to get their word out to share the information, to share all of their research. This is really important to to a younger generation, to the future of this this subject. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think uh, I think Jan will get on with you eventually. It's just he's he's very busy. He he still works uh, for the postal service, so uh, it's hard for him to get time to sit down and do interviews like that. But uh, yeah, he's going to retire soon, so I, hopefully he'll have more uh, spare time to to do things like that. So what about Brad Sparks? <laughs> Brad, I don't know. I you know I would love to get. I mean. But no, I, has anybody ever interviewed Brad Sparks? Uh, I, I I recall seeing a video uh, on on YouTube with him, but I don't I don't think he does it very often. I I, I don't know, you know, if there's a particular reason for it, but it, it's a rare thing. Yeah, it's it's rare that he's interviewed. I'm sure, but and he, uh, he has done some incredible work over the decades. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's done some fabulous stuff. It's just uh, it, it's amazing the insight he's had into government agencies over the years. And that's acquired through experience. You talk to these people. He, he's interviewed um, government officials and uh, I'm sure he has a record of all that. So uh, you learn from it. Each one you talk to, you learn more about the system and how it worked. And he's able to correct uh, a lot of misconceptions about government involvement in the subject, particularly with the CIA. So, you know, he's the go-to guy for that. And so with regard to the CIA and the involvement, what, what do you think the extent is of the CIA involvement in this? Oh, they've been interested in the subject for a long period of time and, and to varying degrees. I don't know if they have any answers. You know, it's still UFO, as far as I'm concerned, unidentified. And uh, they, they may have better quality information in, in some cases than uh, what we've seen, but uh, certainly there's more there to meet the eye than what's been released so far. There, in the past, as I recall the original court case, uh, there, there was evidence of hundreds of other documents within the materials that were released that weren't released. So, you know, we're not getting the whole picture from them about the subject and I don't know how you go about doing that except maybe another lawsuit and whether that would be any more successful is hard to tell. Right. But at least you, you, you can show that, that yeah, there's still missing things. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I wanted to, to mention Peter Gersten and, and talk about that, but we didn't and all. So that just means I'm going to have to have you back again. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. <laughs> I know. And I love that. I mean, it's, it's so cool for those of us who are new to the field or, or just trying to get our feet wet to learn, learn from people like you. And I have to say, all of you out there, you need to go to Amazon to buy clear intent. It is expensive, but it is worth the investment because it is collectible. And then you also need to visit Barry Greenwood's archives it, you know, you can learn so much. I mean, I was looking through Just Cause today and cases from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, made sense to me and connected to the work that I'm doing now. Oh, there's a lot of other material that, that isn't reproduced on the site that are references. I'd, I'd like to reproduce everything, but copyright prevents that. So th there's a list of articles, all kinds of uh, references to things that, that point you right to a particular place to look with all the data, the dates and the, and the publication titles and all. I, I just can't reproduce them all. Well, I, I thank you so much for all of your work. I mean, on, on behalf of so many of us, we 
care about what you've done. And I want to thank you personally for, for adding to my work and to give you have given me incredible information about Utah and information that I'm proud to get out there. And I, I want people to know, please go to greenwoodufoarchive.com, learn about Barry, get clear intent, help Jan. And if you are in the areas of any of these people, you can get a scanner, you can go there, volunteer. It's important to preserve history. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You rock, and I'm having you back sooner than you think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I want to just say thank you, all of you, from, from my family, the UFO Classified family, for listening, for tuning in, for sharing information about the show. We have a brand new show this evening, which is Willie Miranda, who is hosting The Paradigm Matrix. He has... Ronnie LeBlanc on it was done. He wrote a book called Monster Land. I had Ronnie on the show. It's incredible because he deals a lot with the orange orbs with some of these places like Skinwalker Ranch. So it will be an incredible show and I want to thank I want to just congratulate Willie for having a show. So stick around. It's gonna be a great night on KCOR. I will catch you next week. Listen very carefully. This is here to say again, please. <laughs> This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, Visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network.